for grad school um, this last week, uh, we talked about this song. Uh, I, I've got a class right now that I'm taking on Psalms and wisdom, wisdom literature of Scripture. And uh, one of the questions that we asked was, do we have any songs of lament in our churches today? Because in, in the Psalms, and these were to be sung, most of them, uh, you have lament, praise, thanksgiving psalms, and psalms of confidence, and then you have wisdom literature, which is in the psalms as well. And uh, this is about the only song that I could think of that we really, that came to my mind, that we really sing that has lament in it. Uh, where you are lamenting about the realities of the broken world that we live in. Uh, it's interesting that my professor said that he didn't know of any. A while back he was talking, he said, I just don't know of any songs of, of lament. And uh, in it, to his, one of his classes he was talking about this. And, and he said, I think it's probably because we have so many comforts in America. We don't like to talk about, we don't even like to go to funerals, you know. And, you know, we try to cover the bad up as much as possible and think about good things. There was a, a, a TV show I watched a while back where these people come to church for the first time and they're singing, how sweet it is to be loved by you. It's like a seeker sensitive church, you know, and, and it was just so fluffy. And they're like, I just love this. And they go back the next Sunday, they're singing the same song. And they're like, you know, and it's just like sometimes our, it, even, the, even the outside of the church can, can look at the church and say, guys, just, it's all about fluff. Is that, is that it? Where's the depth, right? Um, especially when it comes to prosperity gospel type focus. Where's the depth of, of God, you know, saving us from the realities of the broken world we live in and, and sin and, and death and all of that. And it's all throughout scripture. And so I, that's opened up my eyes more lately. But my, my professor said this, he said that uh, when he was talking to his class uh, one time about this, he said, um, an African-American uh, man in his class said, not in my, in my culture. We have, lot, we have songs of lament. We, we, we have a lot of songs that we, you know, we, we are lamenting about broken things. I don't know if that's because of not too long ago, we think, you know, oh, it's been 200 years since slavery, but it wasn't too long ago that slavery was a reality in America. Uh, and then, you know, of course, we had the Jim Crow laws, all that. Maybe there's, maybe that is why I don't know for sure. Um, but the reason why I share that is because this text today is speaking of God's people in slavery. And there is lamenting that's going on and there's brokenness. And that song is a perfect song that brings us into the text for this morning. Think of Israel. They are um, enslaved to this powerful, control freak dictator, Pharaoh. Their babies have been murdered. Can you imagine going through that as a people? It doesn't get much worse. I mean, you thought that our governing authorities in America were dictators, kind of. You know, COVID kind of brought a little bit of that out. We're like, we felt controlled, you know, more than we had felt probably ever, you know, for me, you know, in my life. And we all, you know, got frustrated with Pritzer. But you think Pritzer's bad fair was, was 10 times where there was no checks and balances whatsoever. He believed he was a god, one of the gods of many gods, and we're going to see that in a little bit. But let's read. We're going to be this morning, uh, Exodus 3.19, and that's going to start us off into looking at the plagues of Israel, uh, the plagues of Egypt. And so before we get into that, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, uh, we confess that sometimes we don't take our brokenness to you. Sometimes even we clean up our prayers and tell you what we think you want to hear. We ignore the sin in our life. We ignore the, the, the brokenness, the sadness, the depressing thoughts. We push those down. And Lord, your word gives us language to 
bring that out to the surface to then heal from the brokenness that is in our land and is in our blood. And so, Lord, we thank you for your word, Lord, that is our, our healing. It is that sword that penetrates like a doctor taking out something that needs to be taken out and healing us. So, Lord, I pray that you would do your work this morning in our hearts. And most of all, may we look to you for the glorious sovereign God that you are, that you use even the broken things to bring something good in the end, to display your majesty and your glory as we just sang in that song. In your name, amen. Exodus 3, 19. But I know, this is God speaking here, or Jesus, Jesus the burning bush. Um, we talked about that before. But I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless compelled by a mighty hand. We'll move on to verse 20 as well. So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all the wonders that I will do in it. After that, he will let you go. Now, notice, church, the emphasis here. God says, but I know. I know what's going to happen here. You know, that's always a good a statement in scripture where God says, but God, or but I know, but I have a plan. I know that this is going to happen. Nothing catches God by surprise is what the statement says. Nothing catches God by surprise. He knows the beginning and the end. He's the alpha and the omega, the eternal God who sees it all. And he knows what's going to happen. He knows what Pharaoh is going to do. So here is Israel enslaved, their children being killed. There's all these false gods in Egypt. The main purpose for them getting out of Egypt was to go and worship God and make sacrifices to him. That was what God was wanting to do. He wanted to take them out of that mess and bring them out to the promised land eventually, but first to worship him, to give them the law and to shepherd them and father them. And so that's the goal. But Pharaoh, a false god, is like the number one threat to God's promises and his covenantal people. At this time, he is the number one threat to God's promises and his covenantal people. Think of it, the promises. They were supposed to be in the promised land. This was all the way back to Abraham. I'm going to give you this land I'm going to make you a great nation. Kings are going to come from you. And, and I'm going to bless you. And I'm going to look at the stars, Abraham. Look at the stars. Look up. Look away from the fact that your wife is barren and the situation that you're living in. Look at the stars. Look at me. Look to the vastness of my creation and know that someday your kids are going to be so numerous. Your offspring will be so numerous. This will be a great nation. You won't even be able to number them. And yet they're in Egypt and their kids are being killed and they're being controlled by a tyrant. Of course, we know that some of this is because of them selling their own brother into slavery. So some of it is like, you know, they kind of got what was coming to them a little bit here. But it's a very broken situation. All these people are living in slavery and and God sees it and he hears it and he knows their groanings and he cares for his people. But in that moment, they probably wondered, where is Yahweh? In fact, they didn't even know his name anymore. I think it was two Sundays ago, I mentioned how the name Yahweh is not used by any of Jacob's children. None of them use the name Yahweh. There's only Elohim until Moses steps on the scene and he says, what should I tell them your name was? The goal was for the reader to be able to recognize like they had lost even God's name. They didn't even know who he was. And they're in slavery. And they're probably wondering, yeah, I've heard about these promises, but don't look like there's any good promises right now. 
Let me ask you, church, what are God's promises to you in Scripture? As believers, as covenantal people that have been brought in, grafted in, us Gentiles, into God's family, God has promises for you. What are those promises? For me, ones that really stick out, he will give me the desires of my heart. Of course, when I was younger, I used to twist that, think that it was me pursuing my desires. Really, I'm supposed to pursue God. It's funny how when you pursue him, also your desires start to change a little bit and become more sanctified. But you pursue me, he says, delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart. That's a promise. His plans are what? To prosper you and not to harm you. I think that's most people's like favorite Bible verse, right? God wants to prosper you and not to harm you. Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purposes. Do you go through a time, been through times in life where your faith was shaken a little bit? Where you wonder, if goodness is, could ever come out of this broken situation. How could anything good come of this? This text speaks to you, just like it speaks to Israel. God knew what was going to happen. He saw it coming. Nothing catches him by surprise. And so here this is this loving father, this God of the universe, Yahweh, Lord, that's his name. God is title, Yahweh's name, right? And I am is the description. Beginning and end, I am the self-sufficient one. And so here God is, this great God. He says, I know what's happening. I know Pharaoh's going to do this. He knew this was all going to happen. And so he prepares his people. He prepares especially Moses to be prepared. Listen, it's going to get worse before it gets better. It's going to get worse the people are going to have to make bricks without straw. I forgot why that is hard to do. Never made bricks. So I don't know, but it makes it hard. Right? So they make bricks without straw. It gets worse before it gets better. But he's like, listen, I'm going to take you out of this. And I'm going to show my mighty hand, my wonders. Notice that. He says, he will not let you go unless compelled by my mighty hand. If you underline in your Bible, that's a good one to underline right there. Mighty hand. So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with what? All the wonders. They're going to get to see God's wonders. They're going to get to see God's goodness. They're going to get to see justice over Egypt for the slavery that they've been in, for the murdering of their children. They're going to get to see all this, and then they're going to come out of Egypt way more rich than they went in. And God's going to bless them in the end. And so you see all this goodness. God's saying, listen, I'm going to prepare you. I was trying to think of an illustration here. And the best I could think of it really for me with my kids was when they were little, six, how do you were these? When we first Disneyland trip, six, seven, eight, maybe. They had seen the Disney movies and, you know, and Star Wars and all this stuff. And we're trying to, their friends had already been, and their friends were like, we're going to Disneyland. And our, and our kids are like, okay, never been there. Don't know what it's like, but we're going. And we're like, okay, guys, but we got a long trip. You know, we were like in Spokane. It was like 21 hour drive, right? And we're going to put these kids in the car. And we strategically did it at night so that they wouldn't hear, are we there yet? Too many times. We drove straight through the night. I was younger then. I could do it. Um, and, and we drove straight through the night to, to Disneyland. And the kids, of course, got antsy towards the end of the trip. And it wasn't, it got worse before it got better. And especially for us, we almost hit a herd of elk in the middle of the night going through Oregon and, and uh, close to where my in-laws live now. Um, but we, we almost hit a herd of elk. We had a blizzard that my wife and my friend's wife, because we were both driving as couples with our kids, were begging us to stop and get a hotel. And we're like, no, we're men. We're muscling through. You know, we, we made it through the blizzard, even though there was a moment where I didn't know where the road was. It was so white. It was just like, I think I'm following this semi, I guess. Crazy, dangerous trip, and then to Disneyland where it was like they got to fight against Darth Vader. You know, they had 
lightsabers, and I'll never forget the look on their face. They, you know, they were just like petrified. It's Darth Vader. And like so many other things that happened where they're like, they're like, Dad, is that real? Is that real? Like we would go on the jungle cruise. Is that a real snake? It was just like the magic kingdom when they're that age. It was like the perfect age, you know. You know, it's just a little, and, and I know Joy and Taylor went back over spring break with these same friends, and she went on this uh, avatar ride, and she said, Dad, it was like, our friends told us this. They said, picture what heaven's going to be like when you get on this. And if a person can think up all of this beauty, think what God has done and what he's made for us. I just thought that is such an awesome description. So it's like, this is a picture of where God is going to take Israel. He's got great plans for them, the promised land. And he needs to show them his mighty hand and his wonders because we all know that when they get in the desert, they want to go back to Egypt and they doubt God and they're always questioning him because their whole mindset needed to be retrained from being in Egypt for hundreds of years, forgetting who Yahweh was. They needed to be reprogrammed. And God did that during the, 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 the desert wanderings. And so they needed to see his mighty hand. They needed to see his goodness. I've got this land flowing with milk and honey for you guys. I'm taking you out of this bondage. And of course, we know that they doubted. You know, church, if all we saw in scripture were these fluffy words of, uh, that were like, how sweet it is to be loved by you all the time. And there was nothing, you know, warning us of, of frustrating times and, and persecutions we received. We would wonder, why, God? Why would you tell us it was going to be all a bed of roses following you? And, and, and it's not. No, church, we have, we have countless texts that tell us, listen, it's going to get hard before it gets better. Take up your cross and follow me. I want to read a couple more. Jesus says, in this world you will have trials. Matthew 5, 10 through 11. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Just as Israel church, Israel was persecuted and, and, and in slavery. And Jesus says, listen, you're going to be persecuted. There's going to be tough times. People aren't going to like the, uh, what, what you believe in. And they're going to go against you. And life's going to have challenges. First Peter Actually, we're going to first go to uh, 2 Corinthians before we go to 1 Peter. It's on, the, it's on the way to 1 Peter. 2 Corinthians 4, 17 says this. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. What a beautiful text. This light and momentary affliction. Do you ever feel like that when you're really going through it? I didn't feel like that when my dad was dying of cancer, this light and momentary affliction, right? He's talking about all affliction. You know, and, I, and yet I'm reminded, my burden is light, Jesus said. Take on my yoke. It's a light yoke. When my dad was passing, we sang hymns and we loved each other. And it was light because of that. And I don't know how Anyone gets through that without the hope of the resurrected Christ and singing hymns to him during your darkest hour. You know, that it was light because Jesus helped us make it light. This light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond anything you can imagine. Avatar is nothing compared to what heaven is going to be. This it's beyond what we can even imagine. Jesus said, no eye has seen nor ear has heard what God has prepared for those who love him. 1 Peter 4, uh, 12, or 1 Peter 1, 6 through 7 first. 1 Peter 1, 6 through 7 says this. 
In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And then 1 Peter 4, 12-13. By the way, in 1 Peter, the word trial and suffering comes up 23 times. 23 times. You know, we are so far removed from that sometimes as, as Americans because we've had people die for our freedom and, and we don't get persecuted like these guys did, but they went through it. And, and so they knew this. And this, this book is about how to deal with suffering. If you're ever going through suffering, read 1 Peter. Read 1 Peter and dig in deep and let the Lord lift those, those burdens off of you and make them light. 1 Peter 4, 12 through 13. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings that you also may, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Church, Beautiful text. Do we need to stop so somebody can deal with their phone? Don't make me have to look at you. Somebody's got a phone going off. <laughs> so maybe you can't hear it, but you might want to check it, whoever's phone is going off. Maybe this is the joke like I did for when I was at Moody Bible Institute and some of the students put alarm clocks all over for our president when he was trying to, to teach. I don't know. Maybe the youth. Maybe the youth are playing one last joke before they graduate. Church. These texts are so helpful to us during trials to remind us God saw it coming. Do you notice how in 1 Peter it says, don't be surprised. Why don't, why don't you be surprised? Why not? Well, church, because God tells you it's coming just like he did for the, for the Israelites. He's saying, I know that the king of Egypt is gonna do this. I'm telling you, don't be surprised, right? So, with all the promises to Israel that God had told them that was going to come to pass, how is this going to work out? How is God going to show his power and his might? How is he going to deal with Pharaoh, this man who was a power control freak, who never softened his heart to God giving him tons of chances to do so? He hardens his heart. Let's see what happens. A quick overview of the plagues. You're probably thinking we're going to be here forever because we still got a lot left on this handout. I'm going to fly through the plagues here, okay? See, the problem, church, was what they believed. When you're, when you're struggling in life or you're sinning in some way, it's always because of some idol in your life, some belief system that is wrong, some mindset that is wrong that you make the choice to do what you do. And so Egypt's problem was really their false religion. And what we see in the plagues is God's might displayed that he is king and Lord over all these tiny little made up gods of Egypt. And he wants his people to know this. Okay. So he nails all of these, these plagues, all of these gods. First, turning the Nile River to blood. Okay, you've got the Egyptian god Hapi. Okay, now I might not say this all right. All these, all these Egyptian gods, I don't got them all, all named right. But Hapi is one. The god of annual flooding and Osiris, whose bloodstream was the Nile River. Check that out. So God, why, why the, uh, the Nile River into blood? Well, because God was showing that I got power over these gods. Then you have the frogs. You got Hapi and Hecht who had the head of a frog. God shows him, yeah, I got, I got those gods. Those are nothing. I got them in control. I'm, control. I'm over them. I'm powerful over them. The gnats, Seb, the earth god, which notice the way it, 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 in, in Exodus here, it says that God strike, says to Moses, strike the dust of the earth. So the earth god, Seb, with the gnats, swarms of flies. You've got Vachi, the fly god, you got livestock die. That's Apis, the bull god. You got boils, 
which is Sekhmet, the goddess of epidemics. You got hail and fire, and that's Newt. I'm guessing it's Newt. Maybe it's Nut, sky goddess. You got Seth, god of storms, all destroyed and and shown that they are powerless with hail and fire. Locust, you get Cirrus, the god of crops, and Serapia, I guess, protector of crops. So they have a god that was supposed to protect the crops, and God sends locusts to destroy their crops. And still, still, Pharaoh hardens his heart. Darkness, the Ra, Ra, which was the most popular in Egypt, the sun god, and then the last one. So he destroys the most popular one. And then the last one, the grand finale, the death of the firstborn. And that touches Pharaoh's own son. Heget is the goddess of birth and men, the god, god of reproduction. Guys, I always, when I, go through the, when I go through the plagues, if you ever read through the plagues, you just think, how did he get people to murder babies, control God's people, and how did he continue to be Pharaoh when all this stuff is happening and he's continuing to just harden his heart? How in the world did he get to this place? Well, church, never underestimate the human heart's obsession with power and to be accepted by people. Those two things are going on. Pharaoh wanted his people to accept that he was God. He did not want to bow down to Yahweh. And he wanted, he wanted God's people to, to, to realize that he is God, King of Kings, over, over God. He wanted the power over everything. <coughs> Church, I don't know what in the world, guys. I'm sorry. It's just driving me nuts. Can we just figure out where that's coming from? We need to take care of that phone. I, it's hard to preach. Thank you, Donna. So, sometimes I feel like it's like the enemy just uses technology, right? <laughs> um, where was I? God's plan for Israel out of Egypt to freely worship him. That's his whole goal. And you wonder how in the world this guy can continue to control and harden his heart and how he could continue to have power over people in church. I'm trying to think of something today that we can take, in, that we can compare to this, right? What is something today we can compare to this? I would say from a government control standpoint, COVID, right? COVID would be a prime example. I mean, think of what happened with COVID. Some of the things that happened was just like, like, are you kidding me? Like you'd watch these things happen with like wrestling, when kids would wrestle, they couldn't shake hands because it's COVID. You, you got you to take that out, Donna. I'm sorry. You gotta, if you could, Amy, if you could just take your phone out into the, into the lobby, please. So the phone is very distracting. Donna, we may need to get, get uh, Caleb or somebody in here. So, um, so church, um, where was I again? Remind me. COVID, that's right, COVID, right? So, so COVID, you guys, was a prime example of, of um, the government kind of controlling things. And, and I get that it was a real disease and all this, but there was so much control that happened that you were like, well, where's the common sense here, right? You're thinking that with Pharaoh. You're like, where's the common sense? Well, don't you see that God is in control of your gods, that he's bigger than your gods? Don't you see that? And, and he's completely like, like just blind to it. And I was just thinking of like, even like basketball. Like my kids are playing basketball. My son's playing basketball. And they're playing basketball on the court. They got to have their mask on, right? Nobody's wearing, it's like on their chin. I call it the chin mask. They're wearing the mask on their chin, right? And, and it's like, does anybody see that this is an issue? That they're wearing the mask on their chin? Like, why are we doing this, right? And then when they would go over to sit on the bench, what do they do? 
They would separate on the bench, like five feet apart on the bench. But then you're going to go body up against somebody in the post. And you're just like, this makes no sense whatsoever. Where are these rules coming from? Right? But, but it was like, you didn't want to stand out. And you just, everybody just kind of went, most people just went along with it. And it was just so frustrating. Like that's a, like one example. And the worst was, in Canada, they shut down churches, right? In Canada, you had churches shut down and pastors were put in jail. And then there were some churches in the United States where the pastor was, um, was threatened to be put in jail. And I think MacArthur was a prime example where he said, bring it on, man. Like we're having church. So church, what I saw come from COVID that was really sad was we saw people staying home after, we saw people staying home after um, uh, uh, COVID was pretty much over with, continuing to stay home. The churches became more empty. The church that I'm going to be uh, candidating at in Ohio, they have been, they have just lost a lot of people since COVID and have never gained that back. So many churches have had that happen. The stats show that church has, has dwindled attendance from COVID by a huge amount, maybe, maybe percentage-wise in such a short period of time, probably more than ever before in American history that that happened. So it was just an attack on the church in so many ways. And thankfully, we had a government that didn't come in and arrest pastors for having church. I'm thankful for that. And I pray that that continues. But I often wonder, if enough pressure was pushed, what would happen? If enough fear was there, what would happen? You know, that was a test for that. Church, you look at this with Egypt and Israel and, and their oppression by Pharaoh. And then you look at the, the, the health and wealth of, of Egypt and their goal was that. And all these gods, if you know, go through all these gods in Egypt, it was all health and wealth, all health and wealth stuff. That's all it was. Don't touch their health and wealth. And so there was fear of losing control and there was fear of losing their wealth and their health. That's really what's going on. Fear of losing their health and their wealth, fear of, the contr uh, of losing control. And look at how God is different than the gods of Egypt. Isaiah 58.3 sticks out to me, church. 58.3. How does God want to be worshipped? How does Yahweh want to be worshipped? Well, he wants to be worshipped not just with singing, not just with fasting, not just with coming to church. He wants to be worshipped in how we treat people. Israel's gods could care less that all these people were in, were in slavery. What do we see in Isaiah 58, 3? God says this to Israel because they were fasting. They were doing all the spiritual things. And he says, why have, this is Israel saying this to God and God is repeating what they're saying. Why have we fasted and you see it not? Why have we humbled ourselves and you take no knowledge of it? Behold, in the day of your fast, you seek your own pleasure and oppress all your workers. So God's not hearing their prayers. Why? because of how they oppress their workers, because how they treat people. It's like James says, how can you praise God with your lips and curse him with the same mouth? Curse people who are created in the image of God, right? With your own lips. How can you do that? Isaiah 58, 3 talks about the same thing. Thankfully, church, our God, his ways are higher and above our ways, and we worship him. We worship in a way that transforms our lives and how we treat people. Lastly, I want to mention here one thing that's often puzzled people and has puzzled me at times, maybe back before Bible school, is why in the world does God harden Pharaoh's heart? So you have the first five plagues, Pharaoh hardened his heart. The last five plagues, God hardens Pharaoh's heart. What is up with that? Why would God harden Pharaoh's heart? A couple points I just want to make here in closing. God gives Pharaoh the chance to do the right thing five times. Over long suffering and patient is God with Pharaoh. Five times he gives Pharaoh the chance to soften his heart. 
God uses Pharaoh's hardness to show his great might and wonders. Why did God harden Pharaoh's heart? After that, he said, finally, God's like, okay, time's up, man. You had your chance. Now I'm going to use you to display my might and my wonders and my justice over you and over Egypt. So now it's justice time. God is a God of justice, just like he is a God of love. It's like perfect, guys. It's the perfect balance. Five loving kindness, merciful, and five justice. Perfectly just, perfectly loving. And you see this with Pharaoh. God bends Pharaoh's evil to be used for his own purposes. This is after he reaches a point of no return. It's like Pharaoh just reaches a point of no return and God uses Pharaoh's evil hardness of heart and he uses it to show how great he is. And then God pulls Pharaoh into his own destruction to display his glory and justice. And church, crossing the bridge to us today, okay? Guys, we live in a very broken world with so much oppression and the Bible teaches us that it's going to get worse before it gets better. It's going to get worse before it gets better in the last days. And then Christ will return and he will deal with Satan once and for all. And all those who harden their hearts, God is finally going to, there's going to be a tipping point, just like with Pharaoh, where his patience will have ended. Right now he's waiting, he's patient, right? Why isn't he returned? Why isn't he, he dealt with all the evil in the world and, and we're done with all that? Why? Because he is patient, it says in First Peter, the book of suffering, patient, I think maybe it's Second Peter, wanting no one to perish, but all to come to repentance. So he's waiting for people to soften their hearts, just as he did with Pharaoh, waiting for him to soften his heart. And he didn't. And then there's a tipping point, And it's like time for justice. And I'm going to save my people. And they're coming into the promised land. And that's where we're headed, church, is the promised land. And it's beyond what we can even imagine. So know that, church, when you're going through something, when you feel the world is broken, know that he is worthy. He is worthy. And someday, as we sang at the beginning of the service, we will cast down our crowns at the feet of Jesus. All the things that we've done in this life, it's all for his glory. And someday we'll enter into eternity and we'll be in the promised land forever. And all the evil and, and, and the pharaohs of this world will be dealt with for good. No more corruption. No more power-hungry people trying to shut down churches. That will be done away with. And Christ will reign on this earth. And we long for that day. But until then, we fight the fight. We carry our cross. We follow him. Why? Because he's told us all this is going to happen. He's a good father and he's going to get us to the other side. Amen? Amen. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that just as we see with Israel, Lord, there's not anything new under the sun. We still have the same issues in our world today with power-hungry people, with brokenness, with confusion, Lord, with false gods. Lord, we have false gods in our land today that promise prosperity and popularity. Lord, these are clearly false gods because your word shows us how we should live. And in America, we have all kinds of ideologies, ways of life, Tell us to do whatever we feel like. Make ourselves happy. Live for ourselves. When, Lord, we know that your word says that we were created to worship you, to glorify you, to know you. And that is when everything fits into its proper place. So, Lord, uh, help us to do that even in the midst of sometimes seemingly living in Egypt where there's a melting pot of all kinds of gods and philosophies and 
ways of life that are the exact opposite of following you. Lord, help us to keep our eyes straight, our gaze on you, the author and perfecter of our faith, knowing that you're going to bring us to the other side, to the promised land, through all of the trials and the tribulations and the attacks, that, Lord, it may get worse before it gets better, but we are headed into the promised land. In your name we pray, amen.